Hey. How are you? Okay. Awesome. Thank you, sister. Yeah, I sure you guys are quite busy. How come all the seats in front are empty? You guys are the classic students, right? Everyone in the back. <laughs> There's plenty of space in the middle. You don't have to crowd over there where you can't see anyways. You, you can just scoot over a little bit if you want. Don't be shy. So uh, today we have um, our folks that are doing week five, recurrent neural networks and language models. Can uh, we just get a show of hands who from this team are here? Can you guys all stand up for a minute? Uh, let's first thank them for preparing all of this hard work so that we can uh, get the benefit of their study. So again, how this works is that the presenters will present. Um, and I think you guys can come down to the front. It'll be a lot easier if you guys are in one place. Um, and then what will happen after that is, or concurrently with that, the questioners for week five will be keeping our Slack channel busy and then also helping to instigate some discussion, okay? So uh, if you're assigned in the uh, next couple of weeks, please look at the model that we're evolving with this. And the questioners are also responsible for coming up with a, a, a post in Slack. Uh, you don't have to do it in Slack. If you have a Medium channel or, or some other blog utility, just put it up, okay? Because there are lots of people who um, would like to know it, uh, uh, this type of uh, work, and any type of tutorial information, even if there are some errors in it, it's still worthwhile to put up, okay? And it will help everyone in the course. So um, you don't want to do it on, on publicly, just do it within Slack, okay? So there's a, a function within Slack that you can use, this function right here, uh, to create a post. Right, and then uh, it'll pull up a, a box or something that you can put up a, something, uh, a message that you can compose, okay? So, yeah. 
I think uh, Joe put something in here already. Okay, so great. Um, let's go on. You guys uh, remotely can hear me, I hope. Uh, you can just put a thumbs up on the Slack channel if you can hear. And, and we'll let um, our team go ahead. Let's see, go back to Chrome. Go up the other window. Okay. So, uh, who's going to start? We're missing Jin, right? Uh, so, when he gets here, I guess we can start. Is he the first one presenting? Who's the first one? You're the first one. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and start when you're ready? Yeah. So, hopefully, Jin will walk his way over. I guess somebody on the team can alert him. Um, okay, so this week we are going to talk about recurring neural networks and language models. So I will start off with by introducing what really language model is, and then it will then lead to why we would use recurring neural networks to do language modeling. So to put it simply in English, language model is just about predicting the next word given <coughs> a sequence of words. So in this example, it's basically the student opened their something. So is it a book, is it laptops, exam, mines, etc. So it's basically a predictive uh, task. Right? In mathematical term, it's basically a conditional probability of the words given the sequence of words before it. So you use language models every day. We use it on our phone, our soft keyboard, Google search, and in a more general, uh, in a more specific language model is the Engram language model, where we it's a very classical modeling of the language model. So what it just do is just basically chunking out uh, the sentence into a fixed length of words. For example, uh, uh, five gram is basically a two two uh, a two tuple of words. And what we're going to do with Engram model is basically to collect the statistics, right? Counting how Copying them in the corpus and then use it to predict what is the next word we're going, come, going to come. So first of all, we need to make uh, simplified assumptions about it so that we can you know, be more uh, specific about the model. So we are going to assume that the word that we're going to predict depends solely just on the words that we come before it, as you can see from the first equation. And it will, the calculation will basically be the probability of all those words, basically the n gram, divided by the probability of n minus 1 gram. So how do we like get this n gram and n minus 1 gram? So first, uh, we can actually approximate it by counting them in the large corpus of text. So you basically count number, the n gram that occur in the corpus divided by the n gram, uh, the n minus 1 gram uh, that appear in the corpus. But however, why is it an approximation? Um, so the probability of the sequence of words is actually the joint probability of word sequence. So in English, it's in more uh, layman terms, it's called oh, the sequence of length n. How many of them is a sequence of interest? And if we uh, go about doing this, you will know that this is a very difficult task to uh, compute. Because you have a lot of n uh, sequence of n length n, so how do we resolve this? Here is we use conditional probability of uh, two random variables x and y. So if we have if the probability of x given y i, it's just basically the probability of x y i divided by probability of y y i, and we re rearranging the equation, we basically get the uh, commonly known as chain rule, and we generalize for n number of variables, random variables, and we will get that it's just a product of the words, given the words that come before it. Right? So we go by the uh, example that we have uh, shown in the earlier slides, is basically the probability of students open their book is basically the product of all these uh, terms together. So that, that is why uh, when we're doing counting, it's actually an approximation. But we generally know that it's good enough for most of the cases. So what we go, 
in the example that we can show is uh, given a word, word J, what given a uh, word given a uh, student open their, is basically the count of student open their, the word, specific words, divided by the count of student open their. Right. So in the corpus, if you count it, uh, it's just basically very simple mathematics. And we have here a, a blue word where we say, should we have discarded the proctor context? I mean, from last week, we actually know that uh, in language, there's long and short distance relationships, as well as forward and backward relationships. That's why if we discard this proctor context, what will happen? All right, so the first problem that comes with n-gram marriage model is, is uh, what if the student, the num numerator term is zero, right? It means that the student opened their some words never occur at all. Right? So a simple solution to it is to add a small delta to every word in the corpus, so you will have a count for every sequence possible. But there will come potentially a problem which I will describe later. This, this is commonly called smoothing. And then in the numerator, there's also a problem. What if the numerator is zero? So what if student open their has never occur at all, so it becomes zero? So one of the solution is you, you actually back off the model, you use the bigram instead of the trigram for this case. However, you, you will see that uh, this problem will become worse as the number of n increases, as the number of the n increases. So typically it's no, no bigger than five. And in Google ngram viewer, you actually, it's the largest actually five grams. So the NR problem is we need to store the count for all possible. And right? so the model is exponentially big. And we respect to the previous slide where we say that oh, we can add plus one to the smoothing for terms that never occur. So if you do that, it's even going to exacerbate this problem. So increasing the n actually makes the model even larger. Right? So how do we counter? So in practice, what does ngram looks like is basically when you count the corpus. For example, this is Reuters corpus. You get like the today the probability of the uh, word rank by the probability, and it usually is like company banks, which seems good enough. But as you use this kind of uh, model to generate text, you'll find that actually the outcome isn't really good, right? It, because when we learned from last week, the lecture, uh, the class is. Language itself have long distance, short distance relationships between uh, words and also forward and backward relationships right, that we derive from the entity uh, passing. So it's to, in order to generate good words, good sentences using this kind of model, we actually need a better modeling technique. Yeah. So how do we do that? I think I will let Sin Zhe is he here. I have not seen him. I haven't seen it. Okay. okay. So we're going to uh, postpone a little bit of the neural language model talk uh, until it's in the live. Uh, and then we'll go with our first presenter to the next time. Um, uh, I think we have to, uh, because I'm Uh, this is actually not an assumption. This is actually the assumption is already stated up front. The n-gram model depends on the sequence of words that come before it. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, you go to that generalizing formula. The mm. formula for this should be probability of x k given x k minus one x k minus one. So it's yeah, but this is a product. This is a product. Right? You generate all the terms that come before. So if you have five of them, you will have five terms. Yeah, but. No, it's a. Uh, so you're getting all, all models. Oh, 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 this sorry. is entire history. Right, right. Yeah. This is entire history. So 
It looks like a biogram, but it's not exactly that much probability. But usually when you go to an n-gram language model, you can't afford to keep the whole whole history. Right? You imagine from the first word the user said to the nth word, like a hundred words down, that's too much vocabulary to keep. So you usually have to truncate it, right? Which is what uh, you mentioned talked about how you might use just one word as um, background or context that would be a background. Um, uh, you probably know Google has something like six or seven, eight grand language models, um, which are big, of course. Uh, everyone is a vocabulary size larger. Uh, they publish the Google Ngram corpus, which is up to five grams, which is already pretty big. Um, but of course, in production, they have much larger ways of uh, keeping everything in memory. They have their whole index. K minus one. Yeah, yeah. So it's just notation. Yeah, you could use it like comma, right? Yeah. So like, say you have like, I don't know, like this thing here, right? that's not quite accurate about this is, um, you know, this is a probabilistic maximum likelihood estimation, but of course you need to smooth it, right? Because if you think about any long engram, that's only going to happen once, right? So it won't make a lot of sense if you use that as an actual estimate, right? Because then you can only basically predict what you've memorized and seen before. So oftentimes you have to, to break this down using smoothing like that, you know, Say you take some lower order terms like pi gram or pi gram terms, trust those observations more than if you trust the 10th order uh, sequence. Right. Does that make sense? So if you're listening to what I say, you you take the last 10 words and you predict the 11th word, pi gram or pi gram, you trust those observations more than if you you take the last 10 words and you predict the 11th word coming out of my mouth. You know, that sequence probably doesn't happen very often. And if you're just looking at data observations, you only have one observation of that. And no observation of any other word coming after that. So if you just trust that prediction, which is this one here, then you would only over, only predict what you've heard before, right? So that's why we will take this moving um, measure to, to trust other n-grams that we might have seen before with a little bit more uh, weight in a shorter context. Right. Does everyone understand uh, what we're talking about? Because if not, yeah, it's all good, right? Okay. So Jin has arrived, just in time, lecturing. Okay, all yours. Thank you, Jin, for the joke. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, I got to profess I'm not like an expert in this, so I might say the wrong stuff. if you. For those of you who are familiar with the topic and you realize I say the wrong stuff, please feel free to stop me at any time and point out the mistake. All right? Okay, cool. So um, we just uh, went through the Ngram model and we are now interested to know like how can we sort of build a neural language model using uh, 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 deep learning. So um, before that, um, I want to we I know we briefly went went through uh, softmax in the earlier part of this course. Um, I just thought that this would be an opportune time to, to give a more slightly formal, not as formal, but more rigorous definition of what softmax is about. Um, and, and of course, the cross entropy loss, which we'll cover in a bit. So um, mathematically, this is also known as a normalized exponential function, the false softmax function, also known as a sigmoid function. And it's a generalization of the logistic function, right? And the reason why we want to use the softmax is that we want to provide some kind of probabilistic interpretation uh, of the classification prediction. And 
one point, or rather it could be one caveat, is that it's much more appropriate for mutually exclusive classes. Because what during training, what, what the model is actually trying to do is that it's trying to push the values of a correct class to positive infinity and the values of a wrong class to negative infinity. So it, implicitly, it's trying to say that it's only one correct class and all other classes are wrong. Right. So, um, so this is how the final output layer will look like. Um, so in this case, the fan out would be just like uh, four values, z1 to z4. And we have a softmax function. And we simply apply this uh, item ele element-wise to the output vector. And we look like that. And, and it looks like that. So the sigma re represents the softmax function. And basically what it does is that it's doing a summation of all the observed classes. So um, when, when it's raised to the, so it's E raised to the value of whatever we see here and summation of that. And we take the value of E raised to that divided by the summation itself. So I didn't explain it in the most articulate of ways, but seeing this function, I think you guys understand what is going on, right? Okay. Um, so some question like, why do we, why, why do we want to use the output values as exponent to the natural log phase? What, what is the intuition behind that? Yeah, so you can, the, one of the hints is that you can think of the, the range of values that the output layer has in the output vector. So from Z1 to Z4, what kind of values these are? So I mentioned just now that the, the correct value will be like positive, a very large number, and the, and the, wrong, uh, the wrong values or the wrong classification will be a very, 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 very small number. Right. So why, why do we want to do this exponentiation? Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, and also and also that because we don't want to. Why why can't we just like add up all these numbers and put their bottom and just take the number divided mm -hmm. by that? Yeah, because we have positive and negative numbers, right? So so the problem with adding up negative numbers is that it's yeah it will not be we we will not end up getting our desired result. So we want to raise. Yeah, exactly. We want to get absolute values. So yeah, we just raise it to e. Uh, as, a, as a base and use the values as exponent. Okay, but this is not quite good enough. Um, actually, this will result in problems. Um, so uh, in practice, we actually uh, add a, we actually subtract the maximum of the value that we see inside. Um, this is just an equation to prove that we can actually arbitrarily uh, add whatever number we want uh, here inside. We can just arbitrarily add whatever number and the probability doesn't change, the distribution doesn't change at all. And, oh, okay, I cannot move that. So why do we want to do that? Why do we want to actually add something? Uh, uh, so in this case, we are actually adding in, in, a, in, a, in an exponent uh, log c. And usually it's, that's, that's taken to be the negative of max of a. And why is that the case? Yeah, exactly right. Because remember that I said that what the output layer will try to do is to get the correct prediction classes to give it a very huge value. So a lot of times it can be really, really large. And if you use that as a power, you're going to get overflow. You're going to get infinity. And that's why we want to sort of deduct that value away from all the values that we have seen. So in this vector, we just see which one is the maximum, and we deduct all these values with that maximum. Right? But in that case, we also end up with very, very small values. And why are we not concerned with that? Yeah, because e raised to the power of something that's very, very negative is just simply 0. So we can deal with 0, right? We cannot deal with infinity. And that's the reason. Okay. Yeah, so now we talk about cross entropy. So what does cross entropy do is that it's simply a measure of distance between what the model believes is the output distribution versus what is the real distribution. So um, in the rigorous terms, I think they call it natural distribution versus unnatural uh, distribution. So a natural distribution is the true distribution, and the unnatural distribution is what your model is outputting. Right. And it's simply explained by uh, this equation here, which I think is quite succinct. Um, and how you actually look like is that, you know, given a, an example, uh, there will be a correct class. So in this case, if our correct class is 1, the true distribution is simply like that. So 0, 0, probability of 100%, and 0. So if you do a dot product of this, you realize that it's simply uh, negative, sorry, negative 1 multiplied by 0 0.67, which is the log of uh, our value. So actually, this is simply negative log of 2x. And you all follow so far? Because everything else is zero, so we just we just look at this. Right. Okay. Yeah. So 
With that, we are now ready to talk about a fixed window neural network, uh, sorry, fixed window neural language model. As we can see here, the output distribution is given by this softmax function. Um, so, um, so I, I don't even know how to, how to begin describing this slide. So maybe we can start off with the, with the bottommost layer. So this is a very traditional feed-forward kind of network. Right? We're not talking about anything recurrent yet. So we start with the words itself. These are one-hot vectors. So um, yeah, given the entire vocabulary, if the word exists in that position, it's just one, if not it's zero, very simple. And after that, we want to convert it to uh, word embeddings. We have already covered embeddings in the, in the earlier part of this course. And we simply concatenate them into a, one single vector. Right? And then after that, we, we are at this layer. And after that, we apply some weight w. And then we end up in this hidden layer. And the output of which we apply it with a weight u. And we end up with the softmax. So um, there are some problems with this. Now, suddenly, there's an improvement over the Ngram language model because we don't have the sparsity problem anymore, right? Um, and, and the model size is actually not that huge. It's not the exponential, not, not the, you know, the V we raised to the exponential of N, but it's just simply O of N, um, N being the window size. Um, but it, but we, we have a problem. And one, is, one of them is that the window size is actually too small and it's never really large enough. If, if we want to look at very long sequences, then, then we'll end up with many, many we will talk about you know, a lot of weights, so the weights add up very quickly. And, um, and also that, um, yeah, it can never be large enough. And also that, you know, every single, every single xi, it actually used a different, I think this is an error. So I tried to draw the matrix, I couldn't do it. Uh, if you want to write the matrix as a vertical matrix. So you will actually use a, different col you use a different column of w, and we don't share weights across the window, okay? So we, um, we ideally, we want a neural architecture that can process any length input, any arbitrary length. Right. So this is how I draw the matrix. You can see that, you know, if you look at W and E, so here the right X, so I just want to treat them as, as E, the embedding itself. So realize that this is the weight matrix. And actually, do we have a pointer? Because every single time I move the mouse, the thing comes up. This one? Like at some point, the yeah, there you have my door. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Oh, but the, the bottom still comes up. Yeah, so, that thing is really annoying. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, right. So, so this is the size. The, that is the fan out, which is uh, the, the row length times n d. So d is the dimension of uh, one embedding. So one, one, the, the embedding itself, embedding dimension, and we have the window size is n. So when we concatenate all this, I sort of color coded so you can see that these are these are embedding for different words. So the purple one is the first word that we have embedding for, and the green one is the last word. And as you realize that when we multiply this matrix, the purple one will only correspond to this set of weights, corresponding to this number of columns that I colored purple. There are some formatting issues, but just you, you you guys can see that right. You only correspond to those weights, and actually the weights are actually not being shared. So. Um, yeah, that's all I'm trying to say in this in this uh, in this slide. And the question is that why, why do we want to sort of share weights across the window? What what's the problem with this? You guys guess. Right. So that was the first problem that we described. Right. You can never have a window size that's large enough. Like if you have, want to have more. Uh, uh, items in the, uh, uh, more items in the window, then, then we'll end up with a lot of weights, right? Because they're not being shared. So we always have to create new columns of weights for those uh, new embeddings that come in. What else? There's another reason, actually. Yeah? So, uh, if we learn one sequence of words, then the way we learn something about them, and then if we move a little bit further, then the way we learn about uh, some other sequence, Right. Right. So it's like that representation is not being captured well, right? If you want to do it in, in, in this sort of discrete manner. So, um, yeah. So exactly that. So um, the number of weights will grow linearly with the number of time steps, just like a feed-forward network. Because basically that's what it is. If you want to have more items in the window, we just need to create more and more weights, and that will explode very quickly. Imagine if we want to study an entire corpus uh, on Wikipedia. That will be a very long sequence. It will just explode. Um, and I also want to capture shared representation across sequences of text. So that's why we, that, that was not a good model. This is not a good model. So how might we want to do it? Is that we propose to do something like that. Um, 
you, there are many different ways to draw the diagram. So some, sometimes you always see this. Um, you might see this very commonly. Um, so this is the, oh no. The embedding comes in from the bottom is multiplied with uh, a weight that corresponds to the embedding. I just denote it as W with subscript E. And it goes into that uh, hidden neuron. And the hidden neuron will, uh, given from the previous time step, will have outputted at H at T minus one. It multiplied that with uh, W with subscript H corresponding to that H that it just output. And from that, we get, can actually output a new H. Okay, so it, it seems kind of confusing because this is, this is recurrent, like a recurrent kind of model. Um, so what people usually represent this is some kind of unrolled out um, 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 sequence. Yeah, so we can visualize it as a feed-forward network unrolled across time. And I think this is a lot more common than we see. Um, and the core idea is that we want to apply the same way as W repeatedly. So the W applies to the output uh, H. So you can see that you know, this, this, is feed, this is fed to the to the next time step and the next time step and so on and so forth. And input, the input sequence, uh, theoretically, it can be of any length. So this thing can go on forever, right? We just keep on reusing the W over and over again. And if we want to have intermediate outputs, we can if we want to do that. Right. And these are the hidden states. And this is basically the same neuron, okay? Right, and this is how the, the matrix for w, uh, WH will look like. Um, yeah, um, is there anything? Yeah, there's nothing special that I want to talk about this. I just thought that I want to you know, visualize the shape and, and make more sense out of what's going on. Um, and likewise for your, yeah, so the, 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 the more important one is this matrix, so it's WE. As you can see that now we just correspond to, to one word embedding. And so all the weights are sort of being shared across the different words that come in, right? So this is the, the weight sharing that we were talking about previously. As compared to what we see previously, it's just that like, you know, every single embedding is, every single word has its own embedding concatenated into one long uh, sort of vector. In that case, they only use selected columns, but now every single embedding that comes in will use the same weight matrix. So far, so good. Any comments? Yeah. Right. All right. Actually, I was, when I was looking at it, I, I had the same problem. And to be frank, I don't have the answer to that question. So, would anyone want to provide your input to that? Let's get the floor before I try to answer. Any of you have some input? Okay, the question is if we're using the same W matrix for everything, doesn't that wash out some of the signal that we might have, like, for example, positional information? When we're doing all this weight tying, that's usually a good thing in terms of tackling overfitting, right? Because you don't want to have too many parameters. So you're using the same set of parameters for all the inputs, right? But do we use representational power doing that? What do you guys think? Let's take a poll. It's more fun that way, all right? Everyone has to answer. You've all had your dinner or caffeine. Okay, you have to put up your hand for one or the other. Ready? Yes, we lose power. No, we don't lose power, it's good. Okay, so the answer is, it depends, right? <laughs> like all good answers, right? But uh, the truth of the value is, is uh, yes, you do lose representational power. Um, it's good to do the wait time when you don't think the position uh, matters much, okay? So things like uh, when you have affixes like doctor or mister or things of that sort, they always appear in the same position relative to something you might want to detect, like a person's name, then preserving uh, information about where that occurs is important, right? Because you can see that a person's name almost always comes right after one of those uh, you know, salutations, right? So if you wash that out by saying you share the weight matrix everywhere, then you, you can't capture that information, okay? So there needs to be something else in the network that captures that. Later on, when we look at more sophisticated models, you're going to see how this really, really simple basic architecture has been permuted to capture other types of information. Okay, that's very important when we get to 
uh, more structured networks that are trying to capture that regularity. Okay, but for right now, when uh, deep learning first came about and it hit NLP, basically they said, you know, let's just throw away everything. We'll do it all the way from scratch. We'll just flush as much data through the system as we can, um, using as little knowledge as we can, and see how good it comes out. And it was pretty darn good. That was the problem. Okay, so um, since then, people have said, let's let's go back and think about whether there's any knowledge that we could actually use to inform the system. And the end result is, yes, there is. Uh, we have to be a little bit more careful about how we engineer it. Um, and that's why uh, you'll see later on that uh, there are more sophisticated systems that are being adopted now. Okay? But yes, this is a fairly good model for how most of it works. Okay, cool. So just an additional point to make. Realize that, you know, the uh, number of rows that we have in this one are actually the number of neurons in the layer. So every single one of these would correspond to the word embed the embeddings that we have here, right? So every single one of these is actually learning something different from the from the embeddings that we have. Here. Okay. Just a comment on that. And right. So oh god, I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is how this is how it looks like in its full glory. So oh no. Yeah, so this input sequence can be much, much longer just because the slide doesn't doesn't have that much space, so we just cut it off at the students open there, but you can go on much, much longer. This can be any arbitrary length. Um, so we start with, once again, we start with the, the actual one hot vectors itself. We transform it to the word vectors. We apply the weight. We feed into the neuron at the, the layer at different time steps, and we just propagate it for it recurrently in uh, this fashion. Uh, and okay, so we have to start with some kind of initial uh, time step, which is h of 0. So in most contexts, at least for the ones I know of, most people just initialize it to zero, okay? And with this, uh, at the end of it, if we want to predict a, the next word, in this case, we can simply uh, provide an output and, and we can see from the probability distribution what is the most likely choice that we can uh, predict. Sort of getting that. It's different. Or, uh, good. Okay, cool. I think it will be slightly clearer in the next couple of slides. So, okay, I actually like uh, the, the the slides provided by Justin Johnson in in, in Fei's class. So, uh, a lot of times we actually realize that you know these are actually the same W and this is you know all the same W. So I can actually write it like that, right? I mean, in, in this sort of computational sort of graph kind of uh, representation. So we, we start with, by the way, is there a name for the H? Is there like a, I don't know what to call it. Like, just call it H. Okay. Hidden state, hidden state vector. Hidden state vector, right. So, so, yeah, so in this case, we can see that, you know, right, actually, I think this, this graph is sort of self-explanatory. Um, it's exactly this, but then now we sort of point it to the source of where the weights come from. And I think it's a lot there. Of course, they use a, the, yeah, this one didn't draw the, the output weights. In the moment, so this one uses L. Okay. So this is clear what this graph is different from the other one. Uh, so in this case, the we will talk more about this in the applications of RNN and what you can do. You can like predict the next word. You can also predict a sequence of words based on what you what you have in the current sequence. So many to many will be the case that you know given a sequence, I will, I want to output a sequence of words based on that. So we actually haven't talked about that architecture yet, right? Uh, RNN architecture that we're talking about is in a sequence, you get out one observation at the end. So that would be many to one. There's another slide from there that says many to one, but it didn't pick up this one. So uh, this is when, in the case where you want the RNN to decode another sequence, right? So this is the famous sequence to sequence, uh, well, sort of, yeah. There, there's a couple different variations on that. Yeah. Good. So, uh, yeah, so the question is when I was. When I first saw this, I was thinking to myself, so, so what's, what's recurrent about this? Why, why do we call it recurrent neural networks? Right, so, so I, I'll answer that. Um, so if you... <laughs> Come on, guys, this is your midterm question. <laughs> yeah, we can think of it as a loop. And, and, and I think one of the definitions I've seen is that you know, it's, a, it's a type of recursion 
where it's time sensitive. That's why we call it recurrent because it recurs across different across different time steps. But we see that the formulation is exactly the same. So we have the, this sum function with parameters w. We take in an O state and we take uh, and we input the current uh, the current uh, embedding for for the word itself, and we output a new state, and this doesn't change. Right? So that's why we call it recurrent across different time steps. So the recurrent part is just that the weight matrix is conserved. Right, and we're tying the parameters together, and we just keep on using the same weights all the time. Right, and, and training, we're training the same set of weights at every time step, when we're back propagating it to a few Right. So, um, so it clearly has a lot of advantages in that it can actually process any length input, any arbitrary length, right? Because the the we don't have a concept of a window right now. This sequence can go on forever, right? If you want it theoretically, of course, given enough computational power. Um, and the model size does not increase because we don't need new weights. The weights are always retained. Um, uh, and in theory, computation for step t can use information for many steps back. But later on, we'll see that this is actually a challenge. Um, and also, like we have mentioned just now, weights are shared across different time steps, so representations are shared. Okay? And of course, the disadvantages is that you know, the recurrent computation is actually somewhat slow. And in practice, it can be very difficult to access information for many, many time steps back. Yeah. And I guess in the next week's lecture, we'll talk more about that. Right, and how do you actually train it? Um, first of all, you want to get a big corpus of text, you know, uh, which is a sequence of words, and then we just feed into the recurrent uh, neural network learning uh, machine. Um, and we can compute the output distribution for every step t, and we simply add up all the loss, and we take an average, and that will be our loss function. Everyone can, everyone can follow that? So that would be the cross entropy loss, you know, softmax followed by cross entropy, and we just take an average of all of, all of them added up. So we're always predicting the next word. Yeah. I, I, I didn't really catch that. I don't see where you're... I lost the epsilon part. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, there, that's after the softmax you will get that. Yeah, from the softmax. It's probably not written. Oh right, I, I get you. Don't look at the Y, right? That Y actually yeah. Y should be after the softmax. So this should be the softmax output, right? Then we apply the cross entropy loss to get this. Yeah. So the basic idea is that maybe the notation that they use they abuse it a little bit, but the idea is that we just take an average of uh, uh, the loss over the entire training set. So always we compute the next word and, and, and we compute the loss based on that. Yeah, so this is the actual walkthrough of the example. So in this case, based on this, we know, oh no, sorry about that. So once we start with the first word, we can sort of predict the next word, and the next word should be students, and we want to get that probability, okay? And based on that, we compute a loss. And we proceed on with that. In this case, after students, the next word should be open. What is our probability on the next word being open? We use that to compute a loss so on and so forth, and add all of this up, we just take an average of that across a, a time step, uh, uh, across a fixed time t, okay? And, um, but, you know, if we were to do this across the entire corpus, it can be extremely expensive. Imagine you have the entire Wikipedia corpus. So that is huge, and how do you take care of that? So one approach is to, you know, to sort of break it into smaller chunks of data, like what we do in stochastic gradient descent. So uh, in practice, uh, we might do it for a set number of sentences, right, um, in a small chunk of data. Um, so, ooh. okay, I wanted to say something here, but I forgot. Or, or 
rather, okay, I, 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 yeah. yeah, so this, this slide is just to visualize what actually happens. In the output layer, we actually output the probabilities. We add up the different probabilities, com compute their loss, and we take, take an average. So this is somewhat a, a more concrete example of what happened for a very uh, simple uh, uh, example. And yeah, so the problem with, with you know, doing arbitrary length is that you know, the whole corpus can be huge, and actually we don't want to do that. That makes uh, bad propagation also very, very expensive. Uh, we sort of want to uh, only carry that out on fixed number of sentences. Yeah. That, that's basically, imagine training the entire Wikipedia corpus to just get one gradient update. That's extremely slow. We don't want that, so we just usually just do for a set number of sentences. Yeah, so with that, I, yeah, so now we talk about bad propagation. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm Yizhuo. I'm going to talk about uh, backpropagation for ions. So we've already talked about backpropagation in week, uh, in week one, I think. And if you are not familiar with the concept of, of backpropagation, you can go to this website. This is CS231N from Singapore. And I think it is a very good review. So what's the derivative of our J, which is our loss with respect to the repeated with matrix WH. So, well, the answer is already given. You have to sum all the gradient, um, of all the gradient together, and at, with re respect to each time it appears. And why is this equation, why the equation is like this? So let's first review the uh, multivariable chain rule. Actually, it's very basic calculus. I think you are, already familiar with this stuff. So, so I won't be talking about <laughs> this uh, too much. Okay, so let's start, uh, let's have a math class here. Are you interested in math now? Yeah. Yes? Okay, great. If no, you have no choice. We have to go through this. Okay, so let's <coughs> use my board. Okay, let's start with these equations first. So what is ST? ST is just hidden, it's just H here. So hidden state, we will use S or use T. And ST is equal to tangent H. This is just uh, uh, any uh, activation function. You already know uh, tangent H is X is equal to EX plus x uh, minus e to the power minus negative x. And u times uh, xt. So xt is just the uh, input. It's just our input. We can use this. This is more here. x is just our input. And st is our hidden seed. I mentioned that. And e is just our uh, loss function. And what is y? What is yt here? Yt is you after you get a, a, a hidden, hidden state and you multiply it with uh, another uh, weight matrix and you do the softmax and then you can get yt. Okay, so let's derive this equation starting from these three equations. So first, we have, uh, so here are three uh, weight matrices we are going to compute. The first one is U, the second one is W, and the last one is V. We start from V first because V is relatively easier to understand. Uh, we have QT equal to V times ST. This is easier for our computation. And we wanna to this derivative. We call that V is actually a matrix, so IJ is just the ith column or j square, i ith row, j square, or uh, this uh, this uh, element. So this one equals to we call a multivariable chain rule.
You guys are okay with this equation? Yes? No? Any question? Okay, so we're just going to calculate this one first, and then this one, and then this one. Okay, so first for this should be uh, this, this derivative should be easy because it's just the derivative of your uh, log yt times log yt. Uh, this uh, with this symbol means this is our pre. This is our prediction value, and without this, just yt is our actual value. So it's just. So we take e our of the base of log, so it's just log. So the derivative is just a one over y t k. K is the because y t is a vector. K here refers to the case element of the vector. Okay, so this is just uh, the first the first one, and then we're going to do the second one. <coughs> so this is just a derivative of, of softmax function. You can try to do it by yourself. Maybe I'll give you two minutes. Yeah, homework. Pull out a sheet of paper. Or uh, five minutes. <laughs> try to do it. Okay, I'll by yourself. So you still re uh, you guys remember what softmax is, right? Okay, we just talk about that. So let's see. It's you guys have it in the Slack channel, I think. I'll look for it. Where's Bala? Are you in the room? Oh, sorry. I guess not. Okay, so one of our remote participants put up a uh, huge list of call functions and things like that. Okay. It's just this. It's just this. And you want to calculate the derivative of this? Uh, maybe not, J. So I'll give you a hint. Uh, when k is not equal to j, or k is equal to j, that's you will get two results. Uh, you guys all clear about that? Uh, when you do the differentiation when the variable is not involved, things drop like flies, and then you get a very simple term afterwards. So that's the, the, the nice thing about doing all of these things is that actually, usually there's only one term active in each of the, and then it simplifies out very nicely. So that's why when you look at the equations that they give you in, in the slides, usually it looks very like simplified. It's like, how did you get from there to there? It's because all the cross terms or the, the other terms that don't involve that variable drop. So it becomes very simple. So I will just write the results here. And if you want to know the process of doing this, I can show you it after class. Okay, so the result is just pretty simple. This is when k is not equal to l, and when k is equal to l, you will get y t k times y one minus one, uh, y t k. Okay. So that's our second term in this. And the third one is uh, dqt over uh, dqt dv ig. So, so what is qt here? It's already here, right? So this one should also uh, should be clear. Yeah. So 
this is just you look at this yeah so so let's say um, let's write qt as uh, that qt is also a vector let's make the the else uh, element of in this vector to be v l uh, m times s p m uh, this is actually Einstein's notation, so it's just a sum VL times SL uh, I, 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 I equal to 1 sum them together up to other elements in this sum vector so by using Einstein notation, you don't have to use the big sigma uh, sum uh, symbol so okay, so it's just this one. So we replace the Q QL uh, QGL with this. So Give my full handwriting. <laughs> you guys know this delta, right? So delta i j. If I equals to j, I equals to j, then it's just one. I plus equals to j, then it's just zero. So this direct number. Uh, direct number. So here, the v l m the v i j. If i is not equal to l, j is equal to not equal to m, then this is just zero. So, so here we have uh, the other i l, the other j m, and times s p m. So, because if m is not equal to j, the whole uh, this thing becomes zero. So, uh, m must equal to j. So here, s p m becomes s p j. Here is uh, so we can so we merge this together to s p j. So that's our result. So putting them all together. So. Uh, this one times this, multiply this one, and multiply by this uh, first. Yeah, here. Okay. So the result is just. So if this is for uh, one element in V matrix. So if you want to know the whole, you want to get the whole matrix for derivative. So it can be written like this. So this is outer product, potential product. Okay, that's it. That's for that's how we get V. That's how we get. Uh, matrix for this week. Okay. Next, let's go for W. Okay. See. So, so this is what I've done just now. Oh no. So we we have already finished the left left part. Now we move on to the right part. How we get a directly for W. Just to check how long do we need for the W part? Uh, similar like this. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll skip the all of it so that we can get through all the presentations. How many more people use this? Just a few of them. I think just should be quite fast one. Okay, and maybe you can finish it up. Uh, okay, so that's that. Uh, Okay. So, uh, 
minus 1. have four of here. Okay, so the only difference is this part. So T when you are calculating um the the S W uh you know that S uh, is a function of W but it is also a function of uh S T minus one. And the S T minus one is also another is also another function of W, so you have to uh, do it iteratively until uh, S T equals uh, T equals to zero. Yeah. So you all get why that's the case. If you look at the other slide, it says that propagation two times. You see the dependency goes all the way back to the first step. So that's why it's really nice. Okay, so this one is you just uh, regard the uh, st minus one as a constant, and you uh, calculate the derivative of this derivative of uh, of w, and then you. Uh, W as function, and you calculate the derivative of this request with respect to uh, ST minus 1. Uh, uh, TM is the. Because ST is also a vector, so TM is the M. Uh, element of the vector. It should be written as E minus 1, E minus 1, and F element of E minus 1. And you repeat this. And finally, we can get. is uh, you starting from I'm starting from zero all the way to the number uh, to the current time t now. Okay. So I, I will just give you the final answer of the first thing. So while you're looking at the derivatives, it's possible to try to map all the main Thank you. 
Weight matrix of three variable <coughs> u, u here, w here, and v here. Okay, so it's called back propagation through time. It's different from our how we do back propagation in convolutional neural network or something else because we have to um, uh, do a derivative all the way to uh, to uh, to our starting point t equal to zero. Okay, so. Uh, Jia Chen will talk about, uh, give you, a, uh, show you a pseudo code of doing uh, of this algorithm. Yeah. Uh, I show I'll show the pseudo code at last uh, because also not very familiar with this. Uh, I'm a newbie in the uh, machine learning and I'm taking the CS3244 this semester. Yeah, and also interesting, so I come to for this time. Uh, so, just now they, uh, I think Jin uh, mentioned that uh, in the INA we can, like, we can train the, we can, we can train the data, like, uh, as high as we want, but we, uh, <coughs> as, as, as high as we want, if the computational, uh, uh, capacity allows, but there's uh, some problem with uh, this. Uh, when we do when we do the back, uh, back propagation for very long sequence of data, yeah. So these are uh, two problems. One is the uh, vanishing gradient problem. One is the uh, exploding uh, gradient problem. So uh, that the reason why is that we are multiplying the same uh, weight uh, every time for every for each of the time step during the back propagation. So if the if the W is like very small, after a few steps the, the gradient will become like near to zero. So you can't you can't get the information uh, of the uh, of like or uh, ten or or even like twenty words before the information of of the the information of the like the, the words before. Yeah. Yeah, so the other if the W is very big. Is uh, w is very is big. Then after uh, multiple times of multi multiplication, then the gradient will become very big. It will be uh, will go to infinity. So it's called the exploding uh, gradient. Yeah. So as you can see, in the uh, natural language processing, the gradient can be seen as the the measure influence of the past on the future. So it's the past words on the the future, the one you are going to predict. Yeah, and uh, this vanishing gradient problem will cause a problem. So when you predict predict the next work, the information from the many time steps will be lost. Yeah. So this is contrary to the to the uh what we, what we want to achieve by the onion, which we we need to like uh include the information long before in the yeah in the word sequence. Uh, I think uh, next lecture we'll talk more about, more about this uh, problem and these are some some uh, measures to counter this counter this problem. So first is the gradient flipping method. This to solve the problem of the exploding gradient problem. So when the gradient is becomes very big, we like clip it to the uh, the set limit. They will uh, normalize kind of normalize to a smaller value. Yeah. So in this way you can. Avoid the exploding gradient problem. Uh, next two, uh, the next one is the use of initialization. Use a different uh, special initialization for the weight, and also use the a different the REL US is a different kind of the the function as comp as compared to the just how we use the the tangent h right. Now we can use a di different kind of the the function. Then we can get uh, get a better result. Uh, to avoid the, the vanishing gradient problem, to, at least to ease the, to ease the problem. So with this, they uh, they introduce a, a diff, uh, a other type of the struct architecture like G, GRU and uh, and also the S, uh, LSTM. But this will I think will, next lecture will talk more about this. Uh, the other problem is the is the when we when the word sequence is very long. 
it will require a lot of the uh, computation power and also very slow. So uh, one solution for this is to do the truncated uh, back propagation two times. So they still... Uh, mm, the, the graph representation. Yeah, there's a, there's a work. So they still go to each of the work. But there's a two uh, two parameters here. One is the K1, one is the K2. So for every K uh, for example, the K1 is like 10. So for every 10, 10 words, we need to update the uh, update, uh, we'll, we'll do up, uh, for every 10 words, we'll go back, we'll Go to do the uh, back propagation to update to update the uh, the last function. Uh, to update the weight, sorry. Then uh, the length of the back propagation is defined by the K two. Yeah. So for example, if the K one is ten, you can K two is at eight. So you go back eight words to do the back propagation. Yeah. So the the below is the explanation of the K one and K two. Yeah, just uh, if I anything wrong, just point out. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, some no it's a notation for this uh, truncated back propagation two times. So we have two parameters. The first one is the uh, n n n is the length of the sample. So it's just a classical back propagation two times. While the other is the variation of the of the truncated back propagation. Uh, the first one is the uh, one one and basically so up uh for every word you need to update you need to go back and update the the weight and the second one yeah yeah second one is is heavy relying on the internal I think the internal state is is just the, the hidden state as well it's uh it's same as hidden state and the third one is the the third one is what I showed like just now is like the when the k when the K also is different, when the K is smaller than K2, so that when the K is 10, the K2 is 12. So, uh, it goes back more, you update more, so. And the last one, yeah, so when the, the going back and the going, uh, going forward and going back are the same. Uh, so when we do the truncated uh, back propagation, we need to prepare the sequence data. So there are some, uh, some met some different methods. So first one is that if your sa your sample your sequence is small, like a uh, hundred words, then you can just use the data. Yeah, when your K one is larger, like hundred, so you can just uh, you you don't have to divide. The second one is just the naive data split. If you have like a thousand, you just split by a like, hundred and hundred and hundred. Yeah, use to train. The third one is a domain specific. It's a, so in uh, NLP you can uh, divide by divide them by the sentence uh, difference. Uh, how many sentence is as is one group. Uh, the, uh, the third one, uh, the first one is the cinematic data. So we can do a free uh, search. Yeah. So it's to do some some primary search and uh, to find the best performing module on the average. Very, very uh, uh, computation heavy. Yeah, yes, and, uh, it's, it's basically an engineering solution to the problem, right? It's just like I have lots of electricity. My startup is rich. I'm gonna search everything without thinking about it. Okay, so please do any of the other ones. Okay, don't do the last one unless you don't care about having her around for the next generation. Yeah. Oh, last one is the uh, is the pseudo code, but you can take a look. I really don't really understand it. Sorry about it. You can take a look. <laughs> Anyone can help explain, and I'll be very appreciate. I can learn as well. So, uh, anyone care to try to give a narration of what you're doing? On this one, we keep it very So hopefully, we keep. Is somewhat accurate. You never know. Okay, let's. So, if you'd like, you can put this particular slide up into the Slack, and uh, you know, you guys can.
by your hand that you're compiling it. I know there are a couple of you, like Nan, who wants to do some of the tutorials for the Stanford class. I think that's a really great idea if you want to invest more time to actually know the math. That's a really good thing to do. Uh, not all of us have the time. I would have loved to do it when I was your age, but uh, I'm, I'm beyond that capability now. Um, so I'll live vicariously to all of you. Uh, I'm Jin Chan. I'm going to talk about RNN applications. Um, after introductions of RNN, we all want to know how we can use RNN. And that is some example we can use RNN for language model, uh, sentiment classification, machine translation, question answering, and even speech recognition and some time series prediction. And this is an RNN language model, just like an Angular language model, we can use an RNN language model to generate text by repeated sampling. And the target output is the next step input. We can see it in this figure. And we, we, have, a, we have one output of each input, but in some other tasks, we only need the final output, so we don't want want to uh, uh, this is an example of RN language model. We can train the RN language model on any kind of text and generate text in that style. It's trained on Obama speech. It's also an example. So also we can change it on the character level. Uh, we, we don't need to restrict to the uh, word level and in the character level we don't uh, we don't need to use the word embedding, just use the one hold. And after we got the language model, how can we evaluate it? A traditional evaluation matrix for language model is perplexity. It's like this. And we want the lower perplexity. So minimizing perplexity and minimizing the LOX functions are equivalent. Actually, we can see the log perplexity is equal to LOX function. And in this table, we can see ions have greatly improved the perplexity. So we got the lower perplexity than the angular model. And why should we care about language modeling? I think language modeling is a fundamental task in the NLP. It can help us to measure our progress on understanding language. And it's also a subcomponent of other NLP systems like speech recognition and machine translation. They are called conditional language models. But we should remember the recurrent neural network is not equal to the language model. Language model is a system that we need to predict the next word. But the recurrent neural network can do uh, more things. It's a family of neural nets that takes sequential inputs of any length and apply the same wage on each step. And optional, it can produce output on each steps. And iron can be used for tagging, uh, like part of speech tagging or NER. In this task, we need the output in every step. We, we need to get the part of speech of every word. 
but uh, for like uh, certain classification, uh, the most intuitive way we can only use the final output to represent this sentence. And in this task, we try to say uh, this sentence is positive or negative. But also we can use the element-wise max or means of all hidden layer, all hidden states. And to generate text, like the language model, we can also apply RN for speech recognition. Uh, given an audience, we want to generate the transcriptions of this audience or like machine translation given a text of one language, we need to generate the text of another language. And also we can use RN for getting the representation of the sentence like in Question answer is we want to encode the questions probably by using element wise maps of hidden states. And maybe we can also combine with other information uh, like in uh, visual question answers, probably combine the representation of the images or videos. And here the RN is part of a large neural system. Okay, thank you. Okay, don't run off yet. Um, so first let's give a big round of applause to everyone who did week five. And if you weren't paying attention on Slack, we can forgive you because there's a lecture going on. So uh, we do want you to spend time watching the lecture. But there is, uh, again, part of the duty is to give everyone who's participating in this class uh, two channels of information, right? The lecture as well as what's going on in Slack. So do check out the Slack, uh, participate in the Slack channel if you can. Questioners for this week are uh, responsible for compiling a set of uh, one post of some sort. Uh, to try to put all the resources together and then uh, we'll, we'll try to publish that either on Slack or in some other medium. Okay, um, while we're still around, I'd like to point out some deadlines. Yes, we have deadlines in this class. Okay, uh, for what's going to happen. So uh, this is week five, right? So let me do that. So week five is here, recurrent neural networks and language models. And next week, you guys have a deliverable. This is a preliminary project. Okay, sorry, you can't read that, so let me blow it up. Can I blow it up? Let me blow it up. Okay, maybe not. Okay, anyways, uh, how do you do this? It is really, really simple. So for those of you who happen to be in my other class for undergraduate uh, machine learning, uh, that one is a lot more sophisticated. So uh, what we do is you move over to projects, Okay, the project, uh, and you need to join the channel. And all you have to do is basically just state what you might want to do. That is about it. So, um, something like, uh, like this, okay? Tentative project, predict housing prices with somebody else. You're done, okay? That's it, all right? You don't have to say much, okay? So we just want you to say what your project is about. Uh, it has to be something related, hopefully, to NLP, or at least using one of the neural architectures. Okay. And when you join the, the channel, obviously, you can look at what's in the channel from before. I think you can scroll back. So I, I scrolled back to last semester when they were doing vision projects. So uh, you can see that some of them were actually doing vision. Somebody was being, building a, a singing system. Uh, somebody else was doing, uh, yeah, well, lots of different things that you could try. 
So uh, you can take a look if you if you find some of those interesting, you can do them. Um, the the posters are archived, so some of the the students did the posters. So this was a, a biomedical project to do uh, nucleus detection. So um, you can take a look at what they've done. Okay, so uh, you don't have to do much yet. So I would suggest uh, you know team up with somebody in the room, or when you go to the project channel, just say, "Hey guys, I'm." Uh, a PhD student in this lab, or I'm a research scientist in this other lab, or I'm from SMU, anyone from SMU in here uh, willing to do a project together, just spit out ideas, and then hopefully there'll be some papers. Keep our channels active, okay? It's no fun if you're just studying in this room by yourself. We are here at NUS for a reason, because there's a lot of people who can come together to learn things together and productively um, as a unit, instead of, you know, people being fenced in various rooms, okay? So that's what I would like you guys to do now or by no later than next week, okay? Uh, I won't give you much feedback on it, but uh, the idea is that from each other, you can learn what types of common interests you have, okay? That's one thing, all right? The other thing that I would like you to pay attention to is that our first segment uh, of class is ending fairly soon. So in week seven, our first half of the class will be over. And that uh, means we say bye-bye to all of the first year PhD students who finished this lab rotation, even though they're not going quite yet because they have to finish the project, right? They have to do their presentation on 13 steps, which is in November. But to give them a proper send-off, I would like to organize an outing to a bar, okay, on the week of October 4th. Yeah, it also happens to be the midterm examination for my other class, okay? But in any case, if you feel like having a drink uh, and then network with the wider community, we will probably proceed from here to the O bar, which is at the staff club close to the track and field. That one doesn't have a dress code. The other snooty bar that we have over here requires a dress code. So we'll go over there and have drinks, okay? So that will be after class at 8 o'clock on uh, 4th of October. If you're game, come and give it, uh, have a, a drink. On, uh, not on us, sorry. I don't have so much money. I'm only a lecturer. I don't get paid a lot compared to those of you in industry. Um, you're welcome to sponsor, um, <laughs> but never mind. Um, then that, that's all I have for you. Okay, so uh, make it a date if you'd like to join. No, no pressure if you don't want. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, those of you who are in week six or week seven and would like to use this room to talk shop about how to delegate things, please do. Otherwise, we will see you later. Thank you very much on behalf of Team 5. So, okay, I'll answer both. Uh, I'll answer their question first, though. For 3244, you have to do a separate project from 62101, okay? So you can't overlap. But I can't compel you because, actually, you're not taking this class for credit, right? So you, I would like you to do a different project, but if you cannot and you don't have the time to, just try to find some way of bringing a, a delta increment over your CS3244 project for display here, okay? Uh, if, if you are participating over there and you're selected for steps, you only have to present in the CS3244 class, you won't have to present over in 6101. Because I can't clone you, I can't, you know, get fork or whatever, right? So you have to be in one place at a time. For all the CS6101, uh, uh, first year PhD students, you will have to actually do a project for this course. What you will do is after week seven, uh, you guys are on your own. Okay, so you don't have to attend lecture. You can if you'd like. I encourage you to. 
Um, but then the only thing is that you have to uh, put up your posters during steps. It's, it's actually not a lot of commitment. Yeah. If you want consultation or anything of that sort about your projects, you can come see. Yes, so they're right here. Um, and they're also on the I steps. So uh, if you go to I steps uh, and you find uh, the past one, let's see, where is it? Uh, 6101. These are all the projects that were done by people last semester. Some of them are in this room, so uh, they can tell you what they did last semester. Uh, but otherwise, you can just click on those for more information. Okay, yeah. You added it to the seven? What? Okay. I don't think I blocked it. You couldn't fill it in. Okay, let's go to do that now. Uh, where is the spreadsheet? These are not recent. How come these are recent? They're not recent at all. So let's see if this is the current one. Yes. I need you to add your own self here. Yeah, and then scroll over to put in your information about uh, which weeks you think you want to put in. Okay. I don't think it's exactly the same. So, uh, you lock yourself. I lock myself. Okay. Oh, don't don't put it here. No, okay. Put it over here. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, so so these are the ones that are not locked. First time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time? Uh, no, no, no. no. What, what should we do? Oh, you're attending for the first time? Yes. You uh, see, see which, in the order of, uh, uh, just mention your preference, for which week you need to lecture. Uh, and then um, give the order of preference for moderating the lecture. So you need to do two things. One is give the lecture, and one is moderate. This one is a few steps. So we are left on the season seven. No. Not taking the course after work. After? Yeah, after work. After seven, I think mine is done. Oh, you are a PhD student? Yeah, PhD student. Now six and seven is done. Uh, it's been registered for six and seven only the mine, somehow. Sorry? Uh, that's what I see here. Yeah, yeah I'm on a week six. Yeah, see? They already put me for. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He put it for six and seven. Um, no idea what does it mean. Are you in six? I'm the moderator for six. You moderator. So someone is presenter, right? Yeah. So it's like Nguyen. Uh, do you know who? No, no. I think there is a. So you are on the Slack channel. Uh, yes. So you can just message on the Slack channel saying. The problem with the Slack channel is I don't have any group of project number six or seven uh, the, for, for the weeks. We should have some Slack channel for that. There is Slack right? channel. So, okay. Oh, my battery is going to this one. Okay. Yes, you will see. Yes. That is more than sufficient. You need to click. Oh, there, are, there are other channels here. But uh, doing that, okay. The performance is separate from the deliverables. They used to have the worst system on the motherboard, and it's not on the don't have anything. This is a trendy one? You yourself yeah. want to do better than that. So Looks of course, you can. Uh, this is the symbol, right? No, 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 no. 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 This one, maybe? No, 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 no. No? No. Six. I see. Okay. Hey, excuse me? Yeah, I, I think I'm... So, I'm a new joiner. I mean, first, if you just said you attached me to this one. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, so, the, is this the Slack channel that we should be following? No. No. You so. need to go to uh, the Slack channel called 6101, CS6101. So, here, uh, I'm Slack. just... Uh, so I ju I can add it here, right? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. You go to this address. 
Okay, and then uh, add it inside. If I do this, mm -hmm. uh, the thing is they always say that if I put my email then a password, they say that uh, I did. They give me this, open this one, and they like there is in some advice, uh, like someone is putting to join me like this. Yeah. So this is what. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so last week I talked to you about something that you about the very good thing. So I get a little bit of a little bit. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's in many ways. ways. What, what time and what date? Yeah, I have not so decided. Yeah. Probably we'll do it at night. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. like this format. Yeah. 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 Yeah.